Keeping the faith. That is the title of an article that we will get to, but first we're going to go after the reason for the article, and that is um, a, an article in uh, 2017, that's this year, in about January, I think, um, uh, in uh, the journal Proteome Research, and uh, you can get the abstract online. You cannot get the actual article itself unless you have a uh, um, an account with some university. Fortunately, Loma Linda is one of those universities that does have that account. And so I'm going to show a sneak peek inside the uh, uh, inside the uh, paywall. <coughs> It's um, long, uh, and I forgot to italicize, Brachylosaurus canadensis. It's expansion for that uh, collagen one sequence and additional evidence of the pre preservation of Cretaceous protein. Basically, they're finding dinosaur protein that's good enough to sequence. And of course, that raises all kinds of interesting questions as we will see very shortly. The abstract is one of the most unusual abstracts I've ever seen. The first part of the abstract is an actual picture, not some words. And that's the picture that you see. And what you see there is a uh, uh, mass spectrometry of a portion of um, one of the uh, 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 one of the proteins that were, or protein fragments that was gotten out of the dinosaur. The abstract, which you can get online, reads, sequence data from biomolecules such as DNA and proteins, which provide critical information for evolutionary studies, have been assumed to be forever outside the reach of dinosaur paleontology. Well, of course, they're too old. Proteins, which are predicted to have greater longevity than DNA, have been recovered from two non-avian dinosaurs, but these results remain controversial. They're too old. For proteomic data derived from extinct Mesozoic organisms to reach their greatest potential for investigating questions of phylogeny and paleobiology, it must be shown that peptide sequences can be reliably and reproducibly obtained from fossils and that fragmentary sequences for ancient proteins can be increasingly expanded. To test the hypothesis that peptides can be repeatedly detected and validated from fossil tissues many millions of years old, we applied updated extraction methodology, high resolution mass spectrometry, and bioinformatics and analysis on a Brachylophosaurus canadensis specimen from which I, uh, collagen one peptides were recovered in 2009. We recovered eight peptide sequences of collagen one, two identical to peptides recovered in 2009 and six new peptides. Phylogenetic analysis placed the recovered sequence within basal archosauria. That's crocodiles. When only the new sequences are considered, um, B. canadensis is grouped more closely to crocodilians, but when all sequences current in those reported in 2009 are analyzed, B. canadensis is placed more closely to basal birds. The data robustly support the hypothesis of an endogenous origin for these peptides, that is, they're really there, Confirm the idea that peptides can survive in specimens tens of millions of years old, which was supposed to be impossible, and bolster the validity of the 2009 study. See, it is reproducible. Furthermore, the new data expand the coverage of B. canadensis collagen 1, a um, 
Finally, this study demonstrates the importance of re-examining previously studied specimens with updated methods and instrumentation as we obtained roughly the same amount of sequence data as the previous study with substantially less sample. We're getting better at this. And then the data are available. The article starts out saying, extrapolation from kinetic experiments, for example, Collins et al. So he's just one example of many. Um, predicts a half-life for endogenous biomolecules of less than a million years. What happens at 60? Well, you have 2 to the 60th, which is approximately 10 to the 3 times 6 or 18th. There should be none left if they missed it, and it's really 2 to the 30th, you're still looking at a decrease of a billion fold. As a result, paleoproteinomic investigations seeking to identify and characterize protein sequences from fossil material have predominantly focused on fossils from the mid Pleistocene, about one and a half million years ago, and younger because we can actually get protein out of them. And there are 21 studies listed that did so. However, preservation of significantly older proteins has been demonstrated, eggshells, 3.8 million years, and multiple lines of evidence suggest that soft tissues and proteins comprising them can persist in fossil specimens as old as the Cretaceous. And uh, there's a list of how many studies have actually shown that. <coughs> 24 to 31, that's uh, seven studies. Um, no, yeah, uh, actually eight <coughs> studies. To date, peptide sequences of collagen 1, the most abundant protein in bone, um, have been detected from the bone matrix of Tyrannosaurus rex. Two studies, and Brachylophosaurus canadensis, using mass spectrometry. These collagen 1 peptides have been consistently identified by uh, mass spectrometry in bone extracts, but not laboratory reagents or entombing sediments subjected to identical MS parameters and have been supported through demonstration of immunological reactivity in bo both in situ and in extracts of fo the fossil tissue. So there's m multiple different ways of finding it and both, and they all agree. Despite the consistency of these data, the endogeneity of these sequences has been questioned and remains controversial. Ask yourself why. Um, this is in part because of the ages of the specimens, which are well beyond the proposed theoretical limits for protein survival in bone that have been extrapolated from chemical models. That's a pretty forthright uh, statement of the problem. Recently, the persistence of vertebrate peptides in these dinosaur skeletal elements has been further supported by additional immunological and mass spectrometry testing on osteocytes and blood vessels isolated from B. canadensis, which reveal peptide sequences for various vertebrate proteins that are also present in modern vessels and which cannot be produced by bacteria. For example, actin, tubulin, myosin, and histones, none of which are found in bacteria. Multiple mechanisms have been proposed or experimentally demonstrated that may result in early stabilization of protein molecules. Um, these have included, one, a role for iron-oxygen chemistry, two, association with bone mineral that may either provide protection from enzyme acti activity or present, prevent molecular swelling that exposes reactive sites. They've so got it in the bone why it stays there for a long time. Or 
Three, preferential preservation of specific collagen one peptides identified in T. rex and B. canadensis because of their physically shielded location within the collagen fibril. That is, the outside degenerates, but the inside stays, and the inside is what we've got. Skipping over a paragraph, and again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, don't have time. The original uh, mass spectrometry analysis of bone matrix from the Hadrosar B. canadensis employed multiple bulk chemical extractions of fossil bone in a combination of ion trap, ion trap, and orbitrap ion trap analysis over the course of one year. Here we present data derived from additional mass spectrometry analysis on the same dinosaur and using new methods of extraction coupled with high resolution MS techniques. These analyses differed from the original 2009 report in that we employed, one, a different chemical extraction technique, two, a different mass spectrometry sample preparation technique, that is, in gel digestion, three, a different mass spectrometer, four, a high resolution and high mass accuracy detection for both precursor and fragment ions, Five, different proteomics laboratory. Six, different bioinformatics software. And seven, more stringent false discovery rate settings. So they did everything differently and they still got the same answer. Strongly suggesting that it is, in fact, the right answer. Virtually the only component in common with Schweitzer et al. in 28 was the dinosaur specimen itself. Thus data reported herein independently test the hypothesis that peptides can be repeatedly detected and validated from fossil tissues many millions of years old. Additionally, we show that with advances in proteomics technology and an increasing library of extant genomes, known protein sequences of extinct organisms may be expanded, potentially increasing their value for phylogenetic hypothesis testing. If you can get the um, um, if you can get the sequence, then you can do all kinds of fun things with it. Now, materials and methods. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. I'm not going to ignore the specimen because we already know about it. It's a standard old uh, hadrosar. Um, Sample handling and anti-contamination procedures just to give you a picture of what, how persnickety they were. Protein extractions were conducted at North Carolina State University in a laboratory dedicated to the analysis of fossilized tissues in which tissues of extant organisms, well, other than humans, are not permitted. There's no chickens running around in there. All instruments, solutions, and reagents were isolated, and all workers wore personal protective equipment, not for them, of course, for the uh, samples, to protect, to prevent contaminant transfer. Silver staining, in gel digestion, and mass spectrometry were conducted at the National Research for Translational and Developmental Proteomics at Northwestern University. So this is inter-university cooperation. At this location, all sample handling and molecular techniques, electrophoresis, gel band excision, de-staining, triptic digestion, were conducted in a laminar flow hood. The air goes in, it cannot come out. Keep sucking the air, uh, or actually, probably coming out and not going in. Um, but it's, it's intended to keep any contaminants out. Uh, in which no extant bone tissue had previously been analyzed, with reagents, buffers, pipette tips, and centrifuge tubes used solely for these fossil specimens and isolated from other lab supplies. Prior to every, and that's their italics, use of the hood, all surfaces and tools therein, for example pipettes, were triple cleaned with 100% methanol. Prior to analysis, I mean just they just did that. Prior to analysis of the isolated samples, the ion optics of the 12T FT ICR mass spectrometer were removed, dismantled, and cleaned by sonication in 
optimum grade methanol for 10 minutes. The ion transfer capillary leading to the optic, uh, ion optic flight path was subjected to additional cleaning with son by sonication and 20% volume for volume nitric acid for 15 minutes prior to washing in optimum grade water and sonication in 100% optimum grade methanol for 10 minutes. They're cleaning everything. And I've, I, I'm going to skip the rest of the paragraph. I mean, it just goes on. Um, you know what I would like to have seen? I would like to have seen one run without all those precautions, just to see how much junk you're actually cleaning away. But anyway, protein extraction, the experimental design is graphically represented in figure one. Cortical, I'm not going to show you that. It's just bunch of lines that go in different directions. Cortical fragments of the B. canadensis fever were ground to the consistency of coarse sand in a mortar and pestle, previously sterilized by soaking in nitric acid for two days, then autoclaving. <laughs> They're killing everything that moves. Um, sediment samples from directly adjacent to the bone were ground separately with a mortar and pestle, identically sterilized. Dinosaur bone or sediment powders were incubated in 40 milliliters of 0.5% EDTA for four days at four degrees centigrade with agitation. An additional tube with no bone or sediment also received 40 milliliters of uh, 0.5, this is a control, and was treated in tandem with bone and sediment samples to serve as a control for exogenous contamination from within laboratory equipment. Again, there's uh, more. Um, uh, there's stuff on how they did their silver stain, which there's a big paragraph I'm omitting. Gel band excision, another big paragraph. Indel digestion, another big paragraph. Nanocapillary liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, another paragraph. Data analysis, another paragraph. Phylogenetic analysis, another paragraph. Ah. Uh, pain in the neck stuff. They are going the, the second, third, fourth, and fifth mile to get this done right. Um, silver staining, I'm going to skip the first paragraph, um, which is the big one. This is the small paragraph. Although staining within the B. canadensis um, guanidine hydrochloride lane, an absence of staining in the control lane supports the hypothesis that proteinaceous material is exclusively present, present in the fossil sample. Silver staining of an SDS page assay alone is not sufficiently specific or conclusive to argue for the recovery of endogenous protein from fossils. Well, enough to argue, but certainly not very strongly. Uh, thus, we conducted an in-gel digestion and mass spectrometric uh, metric analysis of the B. canadensis sediment and buffer guanidine hydrochloride, uh, hydrochloride extract gel lanes to characterize any proteins present within these bands. And I'm going to show you a, a picture. And uh, this, this is one of their little tables. I'm, you, I'm not going to go over all of that stuff there. But I am going to go over the, the sequences that they were finding. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that every single one of these sequences ends with an R or a K. R is arginine, K is lysine. These are basic amino acids. And apparently what they did was they took the proteinaceous material and they digested it with trypsin, which requires an arginine in order to cleave the protein, or a lysine. It requires a basic amino acid. And that's why they all end with either K or R. Um, <clears throat> and of interest, um, in all of these sequences, you'll notice that there's a lot of proline, that's the P, and, the, and hydroxyproline, which is P with an OH behind it. Um, let's see, there's, find you one of the, here's a, here's a proline without being hydroxylated. Here's one uh, not hydroxylated and one hydroxylated. And s this is characteristic of collagen, for what it's worth. Collagen has a lot of proline, and it has proline that has been modified post-translation into hydroxyproline. 
Um, the other thing I'm going to point out is that there is one Q in this mess right there, and there is one N in this mess, and that's right there. Uh, some of you probably know what Q and N mean. Uh, one of them is glutamine and one of them is asparagine. This becomes important later uh, because those tend to lose their uh, amino group and become glutamic acid or uh, aspartic acid. Mass spectrometry. Hydroxylation of proline, however, is a crucial in vivo PTM for the structures and function of collagen one. Um, as hydroxylated prolines play an integral role in the formation of its typical helical tertiary structure. It's not true for most proteins and cannot be produced by bacteria. You have hydroxyproline, it's not bacterial. Thus, the presence of this modification in collagen sequences derived from the fossils supports an endogenous origin. Um, I'm skipping over a lot. Uh, deamidation, which is widely observed in archaeological specimens, and there's some bunch of references there, is also absent in our specimen. However, it should be noted that there are only three asparagine and glutamine ratios, or one aspartic acid and two glutamic acid, present across all of these collagen, one spectra from all peptides. I think that's including the first paper. Thus, it is likely that the apparent lack of deamidation is a factor of effective sampling bias as opposed to a true signal, particularly because vessel proteins detected from the same beet canadensis Showed, de showed deamidation that was variable and incomplete. Hmm. Well, there were two proteins that did have uh, uh, glutamine or asparagine in it, and apparently it didn't uh, really show a lot of change there. Regardless, deamidation does not give a reliable signal for age. What's all this about here? Maybe not mathematically reliable, but perhaps uh, at least reliable in terms of the general. Now this begins to sound like these things aren't that old. But, um, and is therefore an inappropriate criteria of authenticity for the data set. Well, it's probably not inappropriate criteria of authenticity they're probably getting stuff. But it may, it just may be uh, uh, an appropriate criteria for age. Anyway, moving on, there's phylogenetic analysis and there's the conclusions. We describe here in the recovery of eight peptide sequences of collagen one from the non-avian dinosaur Brachylophosaurus uh, canadensis previously shown to contain protein fragments. Here we use different methods of sa uh, sample preparation. Um, uh, mass spectrometric uh, instrumentation and data analysis and conducted these analysis in a different laboratory space separated by several years from Schweitzer et al. These peptides included two sequences that were recovered in both studies, making it highly unlikely that these identifications arose from contamination. Now, what does the scientific community do with all this stuff? Well, there is a paper that came out in this year, later on. Um, uh, it's called Keeping the Faith, which is an interesting title. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, I think this came out in July. So this is fresh off the press. In the face of persistent critics, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer pursues evidence uh, of dinosaur proteins. Now you notice I said the title is available there? Yes. 
Um, when you go there, you will not find an abstract. Um, that's because this is not, uh, this is more of a news article. And the stuff that you are about to see is actually behind a paywall. Fortunately, again, the university has a subscription to science and you can get this if you're a member of the university or if you're a friend of the member of the university who will allow you to come along and, and look at it. The first day of Mary Schweitzer's 2017 dinosaur hunt isn't going well. This is how he starts his, uh, his uh, article. The team has been searching under the high summer sun without success for the fossil-rich strata that braid through the arid rangeland here. Then toward sundown, the AG Chevy Suburban in which she and four colleagues are riding and erupts in a brief poltergeist-like spectacle with door locks jumping up and down and multiple dashboards warning lights flashing simultaneously. Finally, the car gives up the ghost and stops completely. It's a rocky start to a week during which Schweitzer plans to crisscross vast swaths of private property looking for the northernmost out outcrops of beds called the Hell Creek Formation. On nearly p a nearby public land, these same beds have yielded scores of fossils of dinosaurs, but no paleontologists are known to have scoured this section of rangeland settled in the late 1800s. We're really lucky to be out here, says Schweitzer, a dinosaur paleontologist at North Carolina State. The challenges of field work are minor compared with the storm of criticism she's endured for the central claim of her work, that her team has recovered fragments of proteins of dinosaurs old as 80 million years. Um, and I see I failed to turn that green, that is my ellipsis. Um, the evidence which she has laid out in a series of papers in Science and other journals challenges traditional notions of what a fossil is, a stone replica of the original bone. How many of you were taught that? There's no f a bone left. It's all been replaced, right? Well, if that stone includes proteins from the living animal, I don't know what the definition is anymore, Schweitzer says. Um, so moving along, but no one except Schweitzer and her collaborators has been able to replicate their work. Well, as we will find out, that's not quite true. Although the study of ancient proteins or paleoproteomics is taking off with provocative new results announced every few weeks, most findings come from samples thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of years old, orders of magnitude younger than Schweitzer's dinosaurs. And that's partly because nobody looked at them uh, in, in the proper way. I want them to be right, said Matthew Collins, a leading paleoproteomics researcher at the University of York in the United Kingdom. It's great work. I just can't replicate it. Hmm. Others are harsher and suggest that Schweitzer's protein pieces come from bacteria or contaminants. It's problematic that no other lab has been able to replicate Mary Schweitzer's work, said Jason, uh, Jacob Vinter, a paleontologist at the University of Bristol in the UK, who's tried to do so. Notice how carefully she gave her protocol and how careful the protocol itself was. That's because of people like Jacob Vinther. The idiom that exceptional claims require exceptional evidence remains. Adds Michael Buckley, a paleontologist at the University of Manchester, also in the United Kingdom. And uh, Results that would totally upset our way of looking at things require almost impossible levels of evidence. Um, now, before we get too critical of that point, uh, I want to point out that I once had a lady in the emergency department who was having, had missed a period and was having breast swelling and I thought she was pregnant. I sent out a pregnancy test and it came back negative. And I demanded extraordinary evidence. I did something that I have not, had not done before. I walked down to the laboratory and said, who did that sample and what did you get? 
Come to find out, the laboratory analyst had punched the wrong button when pushing, when uh, sending the lab report. So sometimes extraordinary uh, claims do require extraordinary evidence. So it's not entirely irrational for people to react this way. Schweitzer, who came to the field late and whose unusual background casts her as an outsider in a field still dominated by men, isn't cowed. Yeah, we're getting into the, uh, the uh, feminist argument here. She has spent decades building her case. Now on her elk expedition, she hopes to find new well-preserved fossils that might harbor ancient proteins and new evidence to convince the doubters. I don't care what they say about me. I know my work is good, she says. A third generation Montanan, Schweitzer, 62, grew up outside of Helena as the youngest of three children in a conservative Catholic family. Her father, with whom she was very close, died of a heart attack when she was 16, and Schweitzer turned to fundamentalist Christianity for solace, embedding herself deeply in her new community. It'd be interesting to know, looks like she turned from Catholicism to, to evangelicalism. That's what it looks like. She also rejected evolution and adopted the belief that Earth is only 6,000 years old. After earning an undergraduate degree in audiology, Schweitzer married and had three children. She went back to school at Montana State University in Bozeman for an education degree, planning to become a high school science teacher. But then she sat in on a dinosaur lecture given by Jack Horner, who's maverick himself, now retired from the university, who was the model for the paleontologist in the original Jurassic Park movie and the, the uh, novel before that. After the talk, Schweitzer went up to Horner to ask whether she could audit his class. Hi, Jack. I'm Mary, Schweitzer recalls telling him. I'm a young Earth creationist. I'm going to show you that you are wrong about evolution. I'm not sure that's how I would normally approach things, but... <laughs> Hi, Mary. I'm Jack. I'm an atheist, he told her. Then he agreed to let her sit in on the course. Over the next six months, Horner opened Schweitzer's eyes to the overwhelming evidence supporting evolution in Earth's antiquity. If you're wondering why we sometimes talk about overwhelming evidence, this is why. He didn't try to convince me, Schweitzer said. He just laid out the evidence. Which, by the way, is usually the best way to persuade people. Let the evidence do the talking. She rejected many fundamentalist views, a painful conversion. It cost me a lot, my friends, my church, my husband. There's some more in the article that I uh, skipped over, or will skip over the, about that last aspect. But it didn't destroy her faith. She felt that she saw God's handiwork in setting evolution in motion. It made God bigger, she says. In 1990, she volunteered to work in Horner's lab, slicing pieces of Tyrannosaurus rex bone into thin sections for analysis. Under a light microscope, Schweitzer saw groups of red circular structures that looked for all the world like red blood cells. Schweitzer knew this amounted to paleontological heresy. According to the textbooks, when fossils form, all but the hardiest organic matter decays, leaving a mix of leftover minerals plus new ones that have leached in and taken the bone shape. <coughs> Meanwhile, the fragile chains of amino acids and proteins quickly fall apart. Well, over a million years or so. Um, feeling somewhat terrified, Schweitzer didn't want to tell anyone, least of all Horner, what she'd seen under the scope. She confided in a fellow graduate student who spread the news. Horner caught wind and called Schweitzer in. They're in the right place to be red blood cells, she recalls telling him, but they can't be red cell, blood cells. We all know that. Horner stared at the slide himself for five to ten minutes. Prove to me they're not, he said. And um, to chase the blood cell lead, Horner suggested that Schweitzer pursue her doctorate with him. She earned her PhD in 1995, a few days prior to her 40th birthday. 
Um, and she began publishing papers with Horner and others laying out evidence that these apparent red blood cells were the visible signs of organic residues lurking in dinosaur fossils. In their first paper, published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology in 1997, Schweitzer, Horner, and colleagues reported that spectroscopy and chemical analysis of extracts from a T. rex femur s suggested preserved proteins, including a form of collagen abundant in modern animal bones. In 2005, Schweitzer, Horner, and two colleagues tried another technique. They dissolved away the minerals in a T. rex fossil sample. What they, remains they reported in science were structures that looked like millimeter long blood vessels that flexed and stretched like real tissue when tugged by, by tiny tweezers. Horner, now of the Burke Institute Museum in Seattle, Washington, credits Schweitzer for the idea of demineralizing the fossil, a practice rare in paleontology but common for biologists studying modern bone. The preconceived notion was nothing could possibly remain, he says. Well, for good reason. Um, this makes it sound like she was planning on finding that tissue, whereas if you read uh, contemporary accounts, they will all tell you it happened by accident. The bones dissolved faster than they were expecting Schweitzer's most explosive claim came two years later in two papers in Science. In samples from the 68 million year old T. rex, Schweitzer and colleagues spotted microstructures commonly seen in modern collagen such as periodic bands every 65 nanometers, which reflect how the fibers assemble. By the way, humans and <coughs> dogs and cows and whatever else have the same periodicity with about the same length. In another line of evidence, the team found that anti-collagen antibodies bound to those purported fibers. So you can make antibodies against them and they'll glom onto the, the dinosaur stuff just like they would glom onto some other collagen. Finally, they analyzed these same regions with Harvard University mass spectrometry specialist John Asara, who got the weight of six collagen fragments and so worked out their amino acid sequences. The sequences resemble those of today's birds. Others challenge their findings, suggesting that the structures seen under the scope might be bacterial biofilms and that the mass spectrometry results might reflect contamination with modern bird collagen. But Schweitzer's team pressed on. In 2009, she, Asara, and colleagues reported in Science that they had isolated protein fragments from a second dinosaur, an 80 million year old hadrosaur. Asara's lab identified eight collagen fragments. This time, Schweitzer sent samples of fossil extract to an independent lab, which also detected three of the collagen fragments. Collectively, the sequences showed the purported hadrosaur collagen was more closely related to T. rex and birds than to modern reptiles. This proves the first, uh, this T. rex study, was not a one-hit wonder, Asara said at the time. Two labs also detected the proteins, laminin and elastin, with antibody tests, although mass spectrometry failed to turn up sequences for these proteins. There's not enough of them. Moving on, she needs more fossils to quiet a continuing drumbeat of criticism. And the opposition has not given up. In addition to raising the specter of contamination, Buckley and others have argued that antibodies often bind non-specifically and yield false positive results. I, I assume with data. Uh, critics also noted that one of the six amino acid sequences reported in the 2007 paper was misassigned and is likely incorrect. Although in that case it still represents something, Asar uh, later agreed and retracted that particular sequence. That's worrying, says Maria McNamara, a paleontologist at University Col College Cork in Ireland. If you're going to make claims for preservation, you really have to have tight arguments. Why? Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We will not believe it unless we have to. At this point, I don't think we are quite there. 
Buckley and colleagues also dive deeper into the proteomics of ostriches and alligators, as they reported on 31 May in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. They found that a protein sequence in Schweitzer's data reported to be unique to dinosaurs actually matches a sequence from modern ostriches. So you see, really, they got ostrich protein contaminated in there. So the purported dinosaur protein might be a contaminant from modern samples. You can't rule it out. Now you know why those rooms didn't have anything in there except for humans and the dinosaur stuff. Collins added that Schweitzer's samples don't show the degradation expected in certain amino acids after so many millions of years. His work suggests the proteins could survive a million or so years at most. I think he's right. Vinther's results also make him skeptical. He searches for organisms in dinosaur fossils by using heat to break down molecules into volatile components and running them through a mass spectrometer. He has picked up signs of relatively stable organic molecules such as cholesterol and the pigment melanin, but he's never seen the telltale building blocks of proteins. Well, apparently that method doesn't work in proteins. It'd be interesting to see if he did that on ostriches. So I turn a team, have detailed reposts of all of these critics. NC State postdoc and mass spectrometry expert Elena Schroeder notes, uh, who's the first author of the paper, by the way, you'll notice, notes that the collagen seen in their dinosaur samples mostly lacks the amino acid Collins tract. If you're looking for glutamine, you're not going to find it, or at least very little. Where those particular amino acids are present, many are indeed degraded. As for Vinther's criticism, Schweitzer says his method isn't suited for finding trace amounts of protein. So it's unsurprising he couldn't replicate the team's, her team's results. They don't follow our techniques, and then they criticize us when they don't get the same results, she says. Which is probably a fair criticism. She adds that her team is finding more collagen than collagen. It has recovered sequences from eight proteins isolated from what appear to be blood vessels, all matching common vessel proteins such as actin, tubulin, and hemoglobin. It's hard to imagine that all stem from contamination, Schroeder says. At what point does contamination become so unlikely that it's not a parsimonious explanation, she asks. In January, Schweitzer's team reported in the journal Proteum Research that it had redone its 2009 analysis to answer the critics. Analyzing new pieces of bone from the hadrosar, this is the paper that we just looked at, um, and reworking their lab pr procedures to avoid contamination. We had left a full meter of sediment around the fossil, used no glues or preservatives, and only exposed the bone in an aseptic environment. In the new study, the mass spectrometer was cleared of contaminants prior to running the sample, Schweitzer says. The team identified eight protein fragments, two of which were identical to those found previously, and six of which were new. At the time, Enrico Capellini, a paleoproteinomics expert at the University of Copenhagen's Natural History Museum of Denmark, called the paper a milestone. The methodology and procedures all were done at state-of-the-art levels, as good as anything anybody puts out. The evidence of protein sequences looks real, he said. The implications are big, maybe even bigger than he knows. After the JPR papers, some say they are puzzled by the persistent skepticism. I'm not. I don't get it, said Johan Lindgren, a dinosaur paleontologist from Lund University in Sweden who has recently begun collaborating with Schweitzer. It seems like there is a double standard. Well, there is. But some researchers ignoring Schweitzer's multiple lines of evidence while making their own bold claims with less backing. She's extremely careful not to overstate what she's doing. Theodore agrees. I do think cultural factors play into it, and I do too, but I don't think that they're just women. Although, that probably has something to do with it too. She says, noting that few women hold senior positions in dinosaur paleontology. I'm not saying the criticisms are off base, but they're more vitriolic than she deserves. Yes, they are. She says Schweitzer could, should get enormous credit for pushing researchers to rethink their assumptions. Yes, she does. Ever, even if she turns out to be wrong in some details, she has stimulated a huge amount of work. 
and the other details are still good. Back in the Montana rangeland, Schweitzer's voice sounds heavy as she discusses her critics, as though she's built up scar tissue from these encounters. It's taken a bit out of me, she says. Perhaps I'm not cut out for that part. The battles have taken a toll on her funding, too. The na her National Science Foundation grant runs out in the fall. I worry constantly about keeping the lab going, she says. But as she walks over an arid patch of Hell Creek, she perks up again at the prospect of discovery. It's addictive, she says, scanning the ground for ancient bone. Thanks to a private donor, she's got money for another year and a half. Say the government doesn't have to fund everything. And Capolini has agreed to analyze samples of dinosaur teeth in parallel with her lab, which might offer independent support for her claim that proteins can survive deep time. So Schweitzer pushes on, walking briskly across the Badlands in search of fossils, bits of protein, and perhaps one day, acceptance. I'm not much of a fighter, she says, but I'm very stubborn. So you have the picture of a loner who looks like she's got good work, but who nobody really wants to say is doing a good job because the implications are just too big. Now, that was Robert Service. It's interesting because Robert Service also wrote paper Scientists retrieve 80 million year old dinosaur proteins in milestone paper. This one, instead of being in July, is in January, six months before, so that you, you will catch a slight difference in tone. It's not quite Jurassic Park. No one has revived long extinct dinosaurs, but two new studies suggest that it is possible to isolate protein fragments from dinosaurs much further back in time than ever thought possible. One study led by Mary Schweitzer um, who has chased dinosaur proteins for decades, confirms her highly controversial claim. That's, of course, the paper we've talked about. Um, to recover an 80 million year old dinosaur collagen, the other paper suggests that protein may have even survived in a 195 million year old dino fossil. Those of you who've been around long enough may recall this particular paper being discussed in this room. Uh, the Schweitzer paper is a milestone, says ancient protein expert Enrico Capellini who was skeptical of some of Schweitzer's earlier work, I'm fully convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the evidence is authentic. He calls the second study a long shot that is suggestive. But together, Capellini and others argued, the papers have the potential to pr transform dinosaur paleontology into molecular science, much as analyzing ancient DNA has revolutionized the study of human evolution. You may recall that we discussed the Canaanite thing not that long ago. Back in 2007 and 2009, Schweitzer reported in Science that she and her colleagues have isolated the intact protein fragments from 65 million and 80 million year old dinosaur fossils. But the claims were met with howls of skepticism from biochemists and paleontologists who saw no way that fragile organic molecules could survive for tens of millions of years and wondered whether her samples are contaminated with modern proteins. Then last year, Capolini and Matthew Collins, a paleoproteinomics expert at the University of York in the United Kingdom, co and colleagues managed to identify protein fragments from 3.8 million year old ostrich egg shells, a claim that most of their colleagues found convincing. 3.8, well, you can buy that. Well, what about four? What about five? What about 20? What about 65? And now, what about 195? Now the case for dramatically older proteins seems to be firming up too. Last week in the Journal of Protein Research, Schweitzer and her postdoc, uh, Elena Schroeder and colleagues report that they did a complete makeover of their 2009 experiment to rule out any possible contamination. They took new samples of the same 80 million year old fossil, the duck-billed dinosaur. Uh, they reworked the procedures for extracting would be proteins from the bone, identified protein fragments with a more sensitive mass spectrometer, and compared the recovered protein sequences to those from many more living animals. Animals. Even um, Schroeder even went so far as to break down the mass spectrometer piece by piece, soak the whole thing in methanol to remove any conta possible contaminants, and reassemble the machine. About the only thing that is the same as this uh, 2009 study is the dinosaur, Schweitzer says. In their 2009 paper, Schweitzer's team had identified three fragments of a protein called collagen-1 from their fossil. Collagen is the main protein in connective tissue and is abundant in bone. 
Each fragment contained about 15 amino acids strung together. You saw some of the sequences there, which the mass spectrometer was able to identify. In their current study, Schweitzer's team identified eight protein fragments, two of which matched those identified originally. If both sets are from contamination, that's almost impossible, Schweitzer says. Skipping over a little bit, just how these collagen sequences survived 10 millions of years is not clear. Schweitzer suggested that as red blood cells decay after an animal dies, iron liberated from the hemoglobin may, may be, uh, react with nearby proteins, linking them together. Although I'm not sure that applies to bone, or at least very much to bone. This cross-linking, she says, causes proteins to precipitate out of solution, although collagen is pretty much precipitated anyway, um, drying them out in a way that preserve, helps preserve them. That's possible, Collins says, but he doesn't think the process could arrest protein degradation for tens of millions of years, nor do I. So he, for one, remains skeptical of Schweitzer's claims, although I don't. Protein decay in an orderly f fashion. Uh, proteins decay in an orderly fashion. We can slow it down, but not by a lot. Skipping over, her team won't be the only ones exploring these methods. Now it seems that very ancient protein fragments can in fact be isolated and examined. It's a safe bet that many new collaborations will take shape to pin down the evolutionary relationships. Notice six months later, she's still alone. Why? Um, as well as among ancient mammals and other extinct creatures. Says Schweitzer, the door is now open. Well, certainly the people will do it to mammoths and stuff like that. Now, my take on all this, evidence continues to accumulate for the preservation of protein in dinosaur and other fossils. The argument that protein breakdown is too rapid to permit proteins to exist for 65 or 195 million years is strong. I think both sides are right. The solution to this conundrum is to assume less time than the conventional scale. Yeah, some are starting to argue that Schweitzer is a loner who's on a fool's errand. She also used to be a creationist. Others cannot reproduce her results. On the other hand, the first two arguments don't hold water. The third one may be inaccurate. After all, we have somebody finding protein in 195 million year old dinosaur. I think we are stuck, or depending on whose side you're on, blessed with this problem for the foreseeable future. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment over here. Just, just a minute. I'm trying to put, I came in late, maybe you covered this already. I'm trying to put this in some perspective among the professionals who are looking at dinosaur fossils, et cetera. Uh, I don't want to sound cynical, but it sounds to me maybe the the folk who work directly with the fossils without pulling them apart, see what's inside, do not want evidence that suggests different paths of evolution than they are already predicting. Because uh, otherwise, what is wrong with finding amino acids and looking at their sequence? Is it is it the age question? that uh, you, th you think is central? You know, um, there's another article that I didn't use in this presentation, but it's called Schweitzer's Dangerous Discovery. And they cover the fact that creationists are having a field day with this. And I think that nobody wants to say that, but I think that in the back of their minds, everybody knows what's going on. What, what do you mean by that? Well, okay. Uh, Schweitzer herself used to be a creationist. She knows what. She, mm -hmm. she knows what the implications could be. Um, she's also, in a certain sense, terrified of the implications, just like she was when she first mm -hmm. saw red blood cells. Mm hmm Everybody knows they can't be there. <clears throat> okay? She didn't want to tell her supervisor. 
who is himself an out-of-the-box thinker. Yeah, but it seems to me if they accept what you're doing, the take-home messages are adding another tool to evaluate what they consider to be dinosaur evolution. Yes. But why, if that were the case, why wouldn't you title the article Schweitzer's Exciting Discovery? <laughs> I guess I would go back to my original comment. They want to, as, as the ones dealing directly with the fossils of stone or whatever, they are resisting new lines of evidence that might be more more quantifiable than their, yeah. the typical evolutionary analysis based on shape and, and position True. in the column and all that True. stuff. True, uh, and it complicates the picture, and especially if you're doing it in front of everybody, where you can't select the best evidence and present it, but where everything is out there in the open. Of course, that's the problem with the Internet age, is that everything is out in the open, whether you like it or not. Uh, well, I, do you remember our discussion about water bears, uh, was a week or two ago? I wasn't here. For oh, you weren't there. Well, the water bears look like they belong with the arthropod clan. Okay. That's the way they look. They have segmented bodies, they have nervous systems that correspond with water mm -hmm. uh, and velvet worms. Mm -hmm. um, but their genetics suggest that they belong with roundworms. What do you do with that? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I just might uh, comment. Uh, uh, Mary Schweitzer has been here, lectured, and uh, when she gave her lecture, of course, afterwards we had the questions, <laughs> and uh, the, the big issue, of course, of time came up. Naturally. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, what this which, is all about. Uh, this you is knew it all, would. This is all it's all about, of course. And uh, uh, she made the statement at that time that, uh, no, she, she believed in God and a creator. But she also found that the data for long ages was so overwhelming that she didn't think God would lie to us through nature like that. God was not trying to fool us uh, into thinking in long ages by, by uh, changing nature. So the nature uh, seems to uh, say, no, it is, it is uh, long ages. And uh, I, I can sympathize a little bit with her and her when she uh, got overwhelmed by all this data of uh, one person presenting it. Uh, this is not what affects these people when they get to this. You're dealing with a super majority of data that you have to face that has been uh, designed in a context that excludes God out of the picture. There's a tremendous bias there. Uh, you got half a million scientists uh, accepting interpretations that are long ages. You've got a handful, on the other hand, that don't. And uh, it's not hard to be overcome by this supermajority. I would make the case that it's even easier to be overcome if you don't have anybody else on your side. Yes. <laughs> and she, she just, that, that is to say, if you try to do this all by yourself. It, it takes an unusual situation to withstand yeah. that. And yeah. There have been those who have done it, but it, uh, in, unless you are willing to accept, and in my state, the, uh, at least to me, the uh, the overwhelming evidence that uh, in the literature that, that 
They're, they've got they, they've got an agenda here. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you detect that, it's pretty pretty difficult to not to not be overcome. Yeah. Uh, well, that by the way is one of the reasons for this Sabbath school is to try to give people a little more background so they don't have to reinvent everything. And uh, not just the wheel, but the uh, the mass spectrometer. And then the field of science is becoming so broad that it's it's getting hard to evaluate every area as you'd like to, you know. But I, I, w I would just say that uh, there is that scientific data out there that definitely challenges these long ages. Uh, and among them, I would mention. Uh, Rates of erosion, uh, continents are way too fast. This is a simple. Uh, our continents should have been eroded at least a hundred times away, and we're still not in the ocean. I would say carbon fourteen residual carbon fourteen. Hardly any sample has been reported that doesn't uh, old samples, you know, hundred million that doesn't have some carbon fourteen yeah. in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, then there's of course this tissue uh, Schweitzer's work here. But you've got also uh, extremely widespread sedimentary layers out there that tell you, hey, are these things uh, present conditions can do this. It fits so much of the flood that would do this rapidly. I mean, uh, this is. Uh, all this in the periconformity, the gaps between these layers. Uh, we're not without good solid data that challenge these long ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but, but all you hear is the other side, and they never talk about their problems. And you then you, it's easy to and 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 then she mm -hmm. has the additional challenge of knowing. <clears throat> that if she were to claim short age, one, nobody would listen to her, two, her funding would dry up instantly. Now she, uh, she uh, defends long ages mm -hmm. uh, quite vehemently, at least in uh, one paper where she's claimed chelation of iron preserved the proteins and so on. Uh, and so, uh, She's in that particular camp yeah. at present, but I, I, I wonder uh, if she doesn't have some doubts at times about uh, what, what is going on here because of the uh, kinetic, the kinetic data. You know, says, "Hey, this is this is not possible. It's not possible for these things to last that long." Yeah. Yeah. Just a brief comment, but. What I hear going on is something that people who do science over longer periods of time often face. Uh, we were funded by the National Science Foundation with an incredible program officer for over 25 years with, with rather high success rates. The program officer changed. I, we sent a renewal of the, of the grant that was, had, had been very productive. And the response was, we're not new, uh, we're not even going to review this proposal. Why'd you bother submitting it? Talk about, talk about being human. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are, unfortunately, far too many scientists who will suppress the possibility of getting mm -hmm. evidence that doesn't agree with where they are or go in the direction yeah. they think we're going. And that's at least part of what this is. It's not what you know, it's who you don't like. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Coming back here. Um, let's get a mic to you here. <coughs> we we want to hear what you have to say. What are the issues of why they can't replicate? Do they actually can't replicate it, or are they basically don't want to replicate it, so they don't go looking for it? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you will notice that one of the critics clearly did not use the method she was using. Um, 
he was just trying to find amino acids, but he was trying, uh, looking for certain amino acids that uh, uh, apparently are not uh, found a lot in collagen. Uh, it, it sounds very much like he was um, uh, looking under the lamppost for, for his keys because the light was better there without asking, well, where are the keys actually likely to be found? Is it possible that one of the professors here at Loma Linda can write a review bringing up questions about the, the problems of this particular study and what could be done to resolve it? Uh, is it possible that uh, one of the professors here could reproduce her work? Um, I think that, uh, yes, you could. However, if you did, and if people knew that you were a short-age creationist, you can kiss your NSF funding goodbye. Might be a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> In relation to our relationship with God, what comes first? Our funding or our relationship with God? Uh, and if you uh, did prove you, it, you I agree get many with more you. Adventists on your team who do yeah. have money. I agree with you, but I'm going to say this. That's a lot easier to say than it is to do. <laughs> Mary Schweitzer, when <clears throat> she was re referring to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that uh, science is uh, <clears throat> projecting long ages, and if the Lord indeed created the earth a short time ago, he would be um, playing a trick on science. Mary Schweitzer was repeating the initial argument was Theodor Dobzhansky's uh, uh, article, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution, where he first forwarded this argument claiming that he too was a creationist, Dobzhansky, except an evolutionary creationist. Right. <clears throat> to which the answer <clears throat> is clear that in the Bible, the creation account is abundantly clear that the Lord created the earth with an apparent age. The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, etc. Everything had an apparent age, so there is no question of trickery here except, of course, that account is set aside. And, and now the scientists are faced with this dilemma, which I think is the Lord's doing. The well, Lord, I, there, mm. is, there is a theological point to be made. Um, there is a text that suggests that God actually sends delusion. However, it is delusion that is particularly attractive to those who do not want a knowledge of the truth. So if you won't believe God, he will let you believe something that sounds good but isn't true. Uh, Dr. Roth listed a few <coughs> very persuasive evidences for shortage, erosion, and so on. We can also add to it uh, history, the written history of humanity and civilizations which go back only possibly about four or five thousand years at the max. Nobody talks about that. Oh, that, that's, a very but, good, that's a very good point, very important point, uh, because why is it that like pyramids, and aqueducts, and all the relics of human activity is so recent, and if man has been here for half a million years, I, what did he do during the first uh, five hundred thousand years? Well, one percent, <laughs> two percent yeah. of that time. Yeah, yeah. We can also add uh, the linguistics. The word Sabbath <clears throat> is in, in embedded in about a hundred languages, and that means that the week and the Sabbath has been into the, the formation of humanity from the earliest uh -huh. times. By the way, <clears throat> do you know how far it goes back in Hungarian? 
Sombat, yeah, all the way back. The Hungarian and the Hungarian and the uh, Hebrew are probably quite close. It's in, in for instance, the no, word the to the create. The reason I ask is because Hungarian is, of course, in uh, a Central Asian language. It's uh, related my, my to the Arcadian. My son, who speaks both Hungarian and Chinese, says that they that he can see significant similarities between the two. Thank you. The Akkadian language is probably the origin, Hungarian is the extent of the Akkadian language. <clears throat> the uh, word for t create, bara, in Hebrew is, uh, Dr. Taylor was giving a lecture and I heard him say that that is the only language where bara means originally create out of, out of ex nihilo out of nothing. And so I went up to him and told him that in Hungarian, we also have a word called teremt, which is identical in meaning. Only the Lord, only the Creator can teremt or bara. So we, we have this com commonality. <coughs> in, in, so the Hungarian happens to be one of the ancient languages. It's also very difficult to learn. You have to be very smart to learn to speak Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be next, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like, to look at the larger picture, it looks like we're forming a list of silver bullets. We've, er, we've used that terminology for decades now as creationists, as, and I'm speaking as young earth creationists. And we've come up with some silver bullets that get melted <laughs> rapidly or disappear, or they turn into something else. Uh, I'm thinking of fossil pollen in the Grand Canyon sediments. And sometimes we try and replicate things, and um, we're not successful to duplicate the, the original experiments. And I'm thinking of Clifford Burdick's work, and also the CRS uh, group has uh, somewhat replicated Burdick. Um, but then we had a Loma Linda group that failed to replicate the uh, fossil angiosperm pollen. So I, I think uh, we're in a medical field here, a medical research center for Adventism, and we always need at least a second opinion, if not a third opinion. I think we're very close now to having the second opinion from what you uh, presented today. Some of us would like to see a third opinion, and maybe that'll be just around the corner. Well, I, I'd like to see um, I'd like to see some Adventists who are not at, at a stage in their career where they're not too concerned about whether they get funded or not. That would take up this. I don't know that that's very young or very old or very off the wall. Well, you're right that, that you'll need equipment and stuff. Um, but that's where the granting is. Yeah, the, the grant is, is as much for the equipment as it is for the personal salary. One could do this on one's own, um, but one cannot just go out and buy a machine. I will say this, that I know some places where there are fairly wealthy Adventists, conservative Adventists, who would like to make their money count for something. And I know that there are also conservative Christians of other denominations that would like to make their money uh, count for something, um, who, if approached in the appropriate way, uh, which means that you'd have to have a list of, I want this much for this machine, I want this much for this machine, we get it from this donor, uh, we're gonna put it in this building, uh, you know, that you, that you actually have a plan rather than just, uh, well, you know, it'd be nice if we had a mass spectrometer. Um, but if you had people who actually had a serious plan, if I can put it that way, 
um, that these people would be willing to support that kind of thing. Uh, now, it turns out a serious plan is very difficult to do. Yes, but we have a history within our church that research that shortens ages but doesn't shorten them enough is extremely unwelcome. And that is really sad. Well, yeah, that's one of the things about research is it, it is scary. It is it, scary, especially to people who don't understand the parameters. Yeah. Done. Well, uh, the thing of it is science, science is, in fact, precisely this way. That if you start out by saying, I know what the truth is, and so I'm going to go find it. And I'm not going to let the truth speak, I'm not going to let the data speak to me in any other way than the way I want to hear it. That your research is worthless. That what you have to do is you have, no, think about it, think about it this way. I'm going to, I'm going to pull out a biblical example. Elijah walks up to Mount Carmel. He cannot say, well, I want my altar to burn and then theirs not to. And so I'm going to douse theirs with water and I'm going to leave mine dry. Notice that? Of course. Um, the, the point is that the facts have to speak for themselves. Right. And we're scared of letting the facts speak for themselves because what if they don't say what we think? <laughs> understand is the other side is scared of letting the facts speak for themselves because they might not hear what they might hear. Um, um, you know, one of the things that I found that was very interesting, well, I was at the meeting where, or one of the meetings at least, where uh, Mary Schweitzer gave a presentation and then took questions. And I was one of the people who asked her about questions. And I asked, well, you know, what would be really interesting was, to, since we have proteins, do we have um, mm. more right-handed than left-handed amino acids, or, or left-handed than right-handed amino acids, or is it all equilibrated? Um, mm. It's not that hard to measure if you actually have collagen. Mm. Um, and then what would be even more fun is to heat it to varying temperatures for varying periods of time to see how fast the remaining amino acids, assuming that they were not in equilibrium, how fast they would equilibrate. I think that it would be very interesting to see. When I asked her that, she said, no, no, we're not going to do that. And she got this kind of horrified look on her face. I can easily envision her looking at, a, at, at something and saying, oh, uh, I better not tell Dr. Horner, what, what is he going to say? And <laughs> you know, because these things have implications. As you read, even the people who don't, want, don't believe in short age at all, mm -hmm. realize they have implications, but they have even stronger implications that actually everybody knows about. When the person who wrote Schweitzer's Dangerous Discovery, he mentioned the fact that creationists are having a field day with this. They know. Mm -hmm. There's some answers you just don't want. Yes. I don't think we should be afraid of finding what we don't want to see. Uh, well, I think for, we should be afraid, but do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we should, I mean, truth can afford to be fair, for one thing. Secondly, uh, we're not dealing with just one little point, you know. Uh, whether it be amino acids or you get into other pro uh, let's work on lipids for a change. Uh, 
uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, we, there's sufficient data there now that, uh, I mean, evolution is in such deep trouble right now in terms of a mechanism. I, they've been trying to find a mechanism for 150 years, you know, and uh, no one has come up with an explanation of how complexity develops in terms of uh, survival of the fittest and so on, so they're giving up yeah. on that to say that going into uh, epigenetics maybe to try and cover that one up. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're fighting attitudes, we're not fighting data. And if we find some data on one side or another and so on, uh, there's still plenty of data there that uh, I don't think we have anything to worry about if we are emotionally involved in this and who can't help but be a little bit emotionally involved in it. Okay, did you have one comment? Let me, let me get you the mic. And uh, maybe we'll make this the last one. Thank you. This appears to be the same theological issue that the Pharisees and Sadducees had. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but in order to say that, they would lose their position and, their control, over the people. and control over the people. So here we are at beautiful Loma Linda. Yeah. People are wrestling with the same thing. If you take the next step, if you assist this late, well, you could be assisting a non-Seventh-day Adventist or some horrible thing like that, then you would be potentially undermining a wonderful Seventh-day Adventist position that may need to be undermined. Yes. The great issue is, are you going to go out and face truth, whatever the truth is, or will we, will we stay hidden in our beautiful, uh, beautiful hill? Yes. You know, it took the shepherds and the wise men. They recognized Jesus. And I think that there's conscientious, dedicated scientists among us who, this is an opportunity. I don't think we need to worry about money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's like you have to step in the Jordan and then he opens the door. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think that, um, that this whole area it can be viewed basically as a call to surrender and go where God leads you. Anyway, next week you'll get a break from me. So uh, hopefully we'll have some references for you to look at that, that will help, although I don't think there's anything out there that, well, maybe, maybe one of your earlier articles might. I published an article in Dialogue. Yeah. Okay. There you go. We'll, we'll put the web reference to that up.